Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil McPherson. I'm industry programmer for TIFF, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Pitch This competition. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that today's events are taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. I would like to remind everyone that there is absolutely no professional photography or videoing allowed during this session. We do live stream the event on YouTube and our, um, our website, so you can watch the whole event in the entirety again after the event, should you wish. I'd like to extend our thanks to Telephone Canada, not only for their continued support of Pitch This, but their support for TIFF year-round in so many of the activities that we do. Um, I would now like to introduce Stephanie Azan, Telephone Canada's National Feature Film Executive, to say a few words. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 19th annual Pitch This. At Telephone Canada, we believe that discovering and nurturing new talent is a great way to ensure the continued success of our industry. In response to that, We've increased our support for emerging content creators through our Talent to Watch program. This year, we're investing in almost 50 first-time directors who will have the opportunity to make their first features through this program. We know there are a lot of talented Canadian directors ready for the big screen, and many of you are in this room today. Filmmakers, if you're looking for some inspiration and advice about your project, you can talk to us at the Canada Lounge, located at TIFF's Industry Centre. Come by and meet with one of our representatives to find out about production financing, co-producing, tax credits, and international festival support. Before I go, I'd like to thank the Toronto International Film Festival for our Pitch This partner for the important role they play in promoting homegrown talent on a global stage. Now please join me in thanking our distinguished jury members for being part of Telefilm Canada Pitch This, and good luck to all of the competitors. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, before I introduce our host for today's event, I would like to say a few thank yous. Um, first, thanks to all the filmmaking teams from across Canada that submitted their projects to pitch this this year. There were so many fantastic projects, it was very difficult to narrow them down to the six you're going to see this evening, this afternoon even. Um, I would also like to say a big thanks to my colleague, Isaiah Sunich, who's worked incredibly hard putting this event together. A lot, most of what you're about to see is, is due to her hard work, so thank you, Isaiah. So, on with the show. It now gives me great pleasure to be, to be able to introduce the person who will guide you through the projects over the next hour or so, Ashley Botting. Ashley is an actor, writer, improviser, singer, and TV and radio personality. Recently, she launched the smash hit Ashley with a Y, a completely improvised musical cabaret at the Toronto Fringe Festival. She's a panelist and writer on CBC's radios Because News and an alumna of the Second City main stage. Ashley is a Canadian Comedy Award winner and a Dora Award nominee and she also spent eight years working with the programming team here at TIFF. Please join me in welcoming Ashley Botty. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Neil. Thanks to the TIFF industry team. I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm excited to have some fun and to learn some things, too. Um, so as you know, over the course of the next hour, Six teams will have six minutes to pitch their feature film idea. The winning team is going to be selected by a jury of international industry experts, and they are going to be awarded $15,000 from Telefilm to develop the script. That's some cash. The winner will be announced during the happy hour after this event just in the foyer. So when we're done here, go out there and get a drink and uh, someone's going to win something. Um, I want to thank our pitching coaches who helped the teams with their pitches today. Uh, Andrew Nicholas McCann-Smith, Mark Slutsky, Adam Goldhammer, and Katie McMillan. Uh, yes, applaud them. There's also our pre-selection committee to, uh, to thank Carter Bruce, Dan Montgomery, Shireen Barsoom, and Jenna Dufton. And our jury tonight consists of international and Canadian professionals in the film industry, and we are delighted to welcome Ashley Clark, Senior Cinema Programmer at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Brian E. Hansen, Director of Film at the British Council, 
Aaron Levitz, head of Wattpad Studios, Michelle Latimer, director and producer, and Keisha Imani Cameron, chief talent development officer at the Ghetto Film School. So thank you so much for jurors for being here. So it's time to get pitching. Our first pitch is for a film called Learn to Swim. Let me introduce the pitchers. Alona Metzer is an actor, entrepreneur turned producer. Oh, she's busy. Trained at the David N Mamet and William H. Macy's Atlantic Acting School in New York City and brings her strong entrepreneurial spirit and deep understanding of character to her work as a producer. In 2016, she was awarded the Deluxe Producer Mentorship. She is currently, currently developing the feature debuts by Shervin Kermani and Tyrone Tommy, the latter of whom she collaborated with on the short film Mariner. She is a recent graduate of the CFC Cineplex Entertainment Producers Lab. Second pitcher is Marnie Van Dyke, who wrote and produced the short film I Am Not a Weird Person, directed by Molly McGlynn, which was featured on Hello Giggles, programmed by Jill Saltway on her site, Wifey TV, and described by Lena Dunham as a haunting little short. Marnie was head writer for We Day 2017, hosted by Selena Gomez, and We Day 2018, hosted by John Stamos, Uncle Jesse, cool. She also served as associate producer for Match Game. She is a recipient of the Chorus Writer's Apprenticeship at the Banff World Media Festival and an alumna of the Canadian Film Center's Writers Lab. Lastly, Tyrone Tommy is an award-winning filmmaker whose work has been supported with grants from NBC Universal Canada, Kodak Motion Picture Film, and the Ontario Arts Council. Tyrone's films have been celebrated internationally at over 30 festivals, including his most recent short, Mariner, which pr premiered at the 2016 Toronto International Film Festival, and so we know what that is, and was named one of TIFF's top 10 shorts of the year. He is currently in development of the feature films To Live and Die in Rexdale and Learn to Swim, the latter of which through Telefilm's Talent Watch program. Tyrone is an alumnus of TIFF Talent Lab and the Canadian Film Center's Director's Lab. So with their six minutes, please welcome the pitch team from Learn to Swim. <laughs> The most in this world. They pass unexpectedly, tragically. What if you could have done something to prevent it somehow? If only you had made one choice differently, how would you go on? Could you? Learn to Swim takes place over the course of a few days. We meet a withdrawn jazz trumpeter named Desi Williams. He's moving into a new apartment but as the space fills with his possessions and his instruments, we discover that this isn't a new beginning, but in fact, an attempt to escape. But from who or what is he trying to escape from? We learn the answer. Desi had a lover named Salma. She was the vocalist in his band. Music was their shared language. They were soulmates, but she drowned. Accidentally, he thinks, in a bathtub in their home and he wasn't there to stop it. Where was he? Guilt and grief consume him. His psychosis escalates. The memories of Selma and his past appear in the present, blending with the environment of the film. She haunts him. Then while trying to compose music for one last performance, he develops a crippling pain in his jaw, a physical torment mirroring his emotional state. Meanwhile, Desi's band won't just let him disappear. They want him to play, but he can't. They dig in the pressure. And then there's his new neighbor, this brash older woman named Sal. She's knocking on his door, asking questions. It's almost like she is haunting him too. Finally, between the mysterious pains and the memories of his past and Sal's intrusions, Desi cracks. And he's forced to face the truth behind the night of Salma's death. Along the way, the audience starts to question what is real and what is imagined. Who is alive in this world and who is alive only in Desi's mind? Selma, his lover, first exists in his memory, but she soon starts to blur into the present. And who is this older woman named Sal? Where did she come from and how does she seem to know so much? Hi, I'm Alona Metzer, producer. I'm Marnie Van Dyke, screenwriter. 
And I'm Tyrone Tommy, the director of our romantic psychological thriller, Learn to Swim. We are thrilled to share with you today what will be all of our first feature. Tyrone and I have been working together for nearly four years now, including on our short, Mariner, which premiered here at the festival two years ago and was then chosen as one of TIFF Canada's top 10 shorts. It was also here at TIFF where I first met Marnie. We've been developing this film over the past year and our connection was not just through our passion for music, but our shared desire to want to explore the fragility of relationships and how trauma and tragedy can transform our memories of the past. Toronto is such a culturally diverse city with a musicality and a romanticism that isn't often seen on film. And this is our opportunity to explore that. Showcasing people who look like me in places we exist but are often not seen has been integral to all of my films so far, whether as a navigation cadet, a young archer, or here, a jazz musician. We've received a portion of our funding through the Telefilm Talent to Watch program, and we're excited to announce that we've joined forces with executive producer Matt Code here at the festival this year with the film Firecrackers. He's on board to ensure the theatrical release and international distribution of the film. In the past year, he's sold projects to A24, Amazon, Level Film, and Elevation Pictures. Learn to Swim is a film with music at its core. In essence, we have two scripts that run parallel. The screenplay, of course, but also the stories our characters tell through their music on screen. And music is exactly what we need. All the music has to be written, rehearsed, and the actors require training all before anyone walks on set. If we win, we'll use the Pitch This Prize to jump right in. We need to support artists like our trumpeter Teddy to compose the original music that is the lifeblood of the film. Confronting our past is the only way for us to move forward. I know this for a fact because I've done it far too many times. I've been Desi. I've lost love to tragedy. This film allows us to explore, through Desi's pain and through music, how we respond to grief, how we move forward through loss while still being haunted in the present. We start off in the guilt, but by the end, learn to play the music we were always set out to play. Thank you for the opportunity to share our vision and our voices today. A round of applause for our trumpeter, Teddy Zamora. Thank you. Thank you so much for the team uh, from Learn to Swim. Trumpet in the afternoon, that's pretty great. Um, the next film pitch is for a film called Hailu Murgia, When the Time Comes. And let me tell you a little bit about the pitchers today. Alex Ordanis is a producer with experience, all, experience across all aspects of production. One of the principals at Stellar Citizens, he oversees production and business affairs. He served as associate producer and director of photography on the documentary Claude Lensman, Specters of the Shoah, which was acquired by HBO and nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary Short Subject. Alex was listed as one of the 2017 40 Under 40 by the United Macedonian Diaspora of America. Simon Ennis is the award-winning director of Lunar Sea, and You Might As Well Live. His films have screened internationally at festivals including TIFF, South by Southwest, IDFA, True False, Slamdance, Fantasia, and many more have played both theatrically and on television in Canada and the United States and have received positive reviews from publications such as the New York Times, Variety, the Toronto Star, and IndieWire. He is an alumnus of TIFF Studio and Berlin Alley Talents. So with their six minutes, please welcome the pitch, the pitch team from Hailu Murgia when the time comes. Hi there, my name is Simon Ennis and I'm the director and co-producer of Hailu Murgia When the Time Comes. My previous feature documentary, Lunar Sea, premiered here at TIFF before playing at IDFA, South by Southwest and many other film festivals. And it was also very well reviewed by the New York Times. My name is Alex Rodanis and I'm the other co-producer of this film. I've created several, I've made several other films including, as, as she mentioned, Claude Landsman's Spectres of the Show, which was nominated for an Oscar. Today we're here to present our new film, 
about a legendary musician and terrific person, Hailu Mergia. Hailu was the leader of the Walias, the top band in Addis Ababa in the 1970s. Their blend of Ethiopian melodies with Western jazz and R&B rhythms were some of the grooviest, some of the greatest, and some of the most iconic of that era. 30 years after he left a life of fame under the military dictatorship, he was rediscovered driving a cab in Washington, D.C., where he's now been embraced by a whole new audience. I fell in love with Hailu's records a number of years ago, and over the last few years, I've gotten to know him little by little. At first over the phone, then over some beers last time he played in Toronto last summer, and especially earlier this year when Alex and I went down to Washington, D.C., spent some real time with him, and began the process of collaborating with him on this project. Today, we'd like to share with you a teaser that we created from that trip. Since Hailu's found success in music again, it's very important for him to share his story. I can't tell you what an honor it is that he chose us to collaborate with him and help him do that in the form of a film. While trying to produce a documentary about a musician who's not a household name can be a challenge, we feel that success with films like Searching for Sugarman and They Called Him Morgan are examples of stories like this that can resonate deeply with a wider audience. We have an unbelievable team that we're working with on this. Our DP is Catherine Lutz, who's just dynamite and shot two movies that are here at TIFF, Firecrackers and Mouthpiece. And our editor is Matt Lyon, who's an awesome editor who cut Clara, which is another film that's here at TIFF. So the crowds in Hailu's shows range from everything from 20-year-old hipsters to 80-year-old Ethiopian expats. And I've seen him perform multiple times, and what really strikes me is the pure joy that his music brings. What we want to do with this documentary is to help share that joy with as many people as possible. Should we be as fortunate enough to win this competition, we're gonna use this funds to fund our second trip. We believe we need to do about four or five shoots with Hailu in order to complete the film, so should we win, we'll be halfway there. When I first met Hailu, I asked him to explain to me exactly how his music works, how much of it is written, how much of it is improvised, and he told me that what he does is pure self-expression. He takes an Ethiopian melody and he starts to play, and as he plays, he begins to improvise and the music starts to change. As it changes, it just goes off somewhere completely unexpected, and he doesn't even know what he's playing. But in the end, it comes back around, locks in, and lands in exactly the right way. What really struck me about that was, that's not just how his music works, that's how his career and how his life story has gone too. Thank you very much. Thank you. from Hailu Margia, that was great. Um, the next pitch is for a film called A Moment of Pure Joy. Let me tell you about the people that are gonna be pitching it today. Charles Roy is a film producer, screenwriter, and head of innovation at Les Maisons de Prod in Montreal. He is an associate producer of Robin Oberts Les Affamés, which won Best Canadian Feature at TIFF 2017 and Best Picture at the Canadian Screen Awards and Gala Quebec Cinema. Roy is a StoryTech film tech accelerator and an Idea Boost Network Connect alumni noted for his development of neurotech and AI solutions for film creative communities. Francois Blouin directs films, television, theater, and video games. His work includes the critically acclaimed games Far Cry 3 and Far Cry 4 from Ubisoft Montreal. He recently directed and conceptualized three cinema cinematographic, sure, virtual reality experiences for Cirque du Soleil in 3D with Felix A. Paul Studios. In 2016 and 2017, he adapted and directed Hamlet Director's Cut, a show combining live motion capture and holographic projections in order pr to present the Shakespeare play in a new format. He also collaborates with Moment Factory to conceptualize shows that mix virtual and live content as silent era multimedia installations in LAX airport. Francois learned the ropes working in the advertising world for over 15 years. He is currently writing a feature film funded by Sodec and, Sodec and Telefilm Canada and produced by La, La Maison de Prod, which has just been pitched to Frontier and Fantasia. Francois is also a professional clown and performs on a regular basis for different circus productions or just for fun. Please welcome them. Hey, hello. Um, my name is Francois Blouin, I'm the writer, director. And my name is Charles Stéphane Roy, I'm one of the producers of the film. So, is there anything more fascinating than crazy adventurers? Is there anything more inspiring 
than maverick directors and foolish poet. For me, there isn't. I guess it's why I saw Fitzcarraldo, the Werner Zog masterpiece, at the age of six. And don't worry, my parents, I mean, were good to me. Uh, but still, I was watching The Muppet Show, it's okay. So, just to balance that craziness. But when I saw that film and I saw that guy, that crazy character, that poet, that bringing like boats over the hill, I was like, wow, that could be my life at six years old. I mean, it was quite inspiring. It grows on me. And I went like around 20 years old. I was in Montreal back then. And I heard that there was a big Hollywood movie coming in town in Montreal to be shot. It was a sci-fi one. I was a big fan of Star Wars. And then I understood that Battle Theater was coming to Montreal. And you know what? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to say that you have in front of you the Battle Theater video assist. Yes. <laughs> so. And on that set, I discovered that many times the magic is happening more behind the camera than in front for many reasons. I was astonished by the passion of all the technicians, the crazy creators, and it really inspired me. This movie we are here to talk about, which is a moment of pure joy. Uh, it's a surreal comedy about movie making. Uh, it's all start with Cynthia, a young filmmaker that wants to break through in the business and that she's been offered to do a making of of that movie being shot in Montreal. Uh, which is a sci-fi B-movie straight to video. Uh, it's great, I mean, but she soon figured out that Werner, which is a German old commercial director, is doing that script, and Werner ate making of. He don't, want, he don't like to be watched when he's creating, and he ate the script he's working on. So you can imagine the tension on set. And, but Werner, since it's at the end of his career, he really wants to give a last shot to do and create a moment of beauty. So meanwhile of casting, he's, going, he's having lots of problems with the actors in Montreal because they all have French-Canadian accent and it bothers him, you know, for many reasons. And so he discovered finally his main actor by seeing the deli pizza delivery boy bringing food to the casting session and he decided to hire him as his main role. So production going, going nuts. I mean, he's going to push his main actor, that non-actor, to become his main character and at the end of the day, his main character is going to flee away, and that's Cynthia, the young actress, that's going to be able to bring him back because she has a cool relation with that young guy. At the end, it's all going to finish with a drowning scene where there's a brainwashing, uh, where they're brainwashing Alan, and that's the moment where everybody's going to get their moment of pure joy. Werner's going to go to an ecstatic state of joyfulness because he just created a beautiful shot, and Cynthia is going to take over the set because now Werner is totally out of his mind and joyful forever. Uh, so that's my story and that's what I want to shoot. <laughs> so um, what brought us to, um, to this talent and uh, to work with uh, Francois, which uh, he has a, a extremely good uh, comedy skills and a really talented uh, director of actors, but he also has this, this uh, huge uh, experience and he brings this to the table and pretty much what we're looking for in terms of doing this kind of film, which is also an homage to Day for Night and uh, cult uh, movies like uh, Living Oblivion. Um, as a producer, we have a proven track record. Um, my producing partner and I did uh, our uh, 15 feature films. Many of them have, have played here at TIFF, notably uh, Robin Aubert's Les Affamés, which won the best Canadian feature last year and also been bought by Netflix worldwide. Uh, we got privileged to have development funding from Telefilm Canada and Sodec, and we already, the project has been pitched uh, already to uh, sales agents who express um, interest uh, during Frontier and the Rencontre de Coproduction Francophone in Switzerland this summer. And uh, next step is, whoop, <laughs> next step is um, we have a script ready. Uh, especially for TIFF, so we're ready to introduce the project to uh, Canadian distributors, and we're going to uh, take good care of the $15,000, um, especially to hire a, a top casting director uh, to attract um, um, high-profile high, high uh, actor uh, for the role, uh, role of Werner, and hopefully uh, start shooting this thing and having our own moment of future by the end of next year. Thank yeah. you so much. So we really want to create that homage to the movie maker and the crazy poet. Thanks for listening. See you soon, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, bye.
Wonderful. Thank you to the team of A Moment of Pure Joy. Our next pitch is for a film called St. Jones 7. And let me tell you about who's coming out here to pitch it to you. Kyle Rideout is a director, writer, and actor. His latest feature film, Adventures in Public School, premiered at TIFF, was selected by TIFF for Canada's Top 10, and was nominated for a Canadian Screen Award for Best Original Screen Pay Play and sold to Netflix. His directorial debut, Edward, won five Audience Choice Awards and multiple, multiple Best Feature Special Jury Prizes at festivals worldwide. His short films, Hop the Twig and Wait for Rain, won on the CBC short film Face Off and Best Short at Comic Con, respectively. Josh Epstein was a producer and co writer on the film Adventures in Public School. His first film, Edward, won five International Film Festival Awards and was distributed around the world. This year, Josh was nominated for 10 Leo Awards and a Canadian Screen Award for Best Original Screenplay. As an actor, he was nominated for a Jesse Richard Theatre Award and a Dora Maver Moore Award, and is currently rewriting scripts for E1, Mark Gordon, and a Canadian Berlin co-production. Katie Hoffman is a Vancouver-based actor and writer. As a playwright, she wrote Karaoke the Musical, The Bush Party, Lady Parts, and the criti critically acclaimed The After Party. Her play, Green Lake, was nominated for six Jesse Awards, including Outstanding Production. Her newest play, What If, will tour elementary schools across the province with Green Thumb Theater. Cheyenne Maberly is a writer, actor, and producer from Vancouver. Her writing credits include The After Party, Karaoke the Musical, Bush Party, Lady Parts, and The Rules. As an actor, Cheyenne has recently appeared on Bravo Network's Imposters and Red Letter Films docudrama, Mo Mysteries. Her hit show, The After Party, was the recipient of Pick of the Fringe, the Georgia Straits Crit Critics' Choice Award, and the Culch Evading Award, which was nominated for a 2018 Jesse Richardson Award for Best Performance by an Ensemble. Cheyenne is a graduate of Studio 58. So with their six minutes to pitch to you, please welcome the team from St. Jones 7. Hello, hey. So I'm Josh Epstein. And I'm Kyle Rideout. Wow, that Give was it great. up for Give Josh for and Kyle. Them. What a pitch. Good job. Wow. They know their names, that's good. Hi. Hello. I'm Cheyenne Maberly. And I'm Katie Hoffman. And we are the brains behind St. Jones 7. We were inspired to write this film because Josh and Kyle were like, hey, wanna write a film? And we were like, sure. And they were like, want to write a sports film? And we're like, nah, sports are boring. So we wrote a movie about strong ass women punching each other in the face. Because that's how we roll. Um, a little background about us. Katie and I met in theater school. We met at an orgy. Same thing. Um, and after years of slogging away as actors, we decided to make our own company, After Party Theater. We, in our first year, we won many awards, including the Georgia Straits Critics' Choice Award, a Jesse Richardson Award, and the Coveted Culture Award. But what we're most proud of is that our feminist sketch comedy show, Lady Parts, employed 50 female-identified comedians and artists last season. And everyone got paid. <laughs> We started After Party Theater because we were sick of auditioning for roles such as 50-year-old woman with diabetes. I'm 28. Hot girl. I'm not hot. Mother to a 35-year-old. Again, 28. Woman with an unfortunate bathroom incident. That role should have been mine. Grandmother. I booked this. I'm 28. <laughs> so we wrote a movie. St. Jones 7 is a film we would have wanted to see when we were young, but we couldn't because it didn't exist. It's a comedy following an ex-WWF wrestler, Paul the Pulverizer, whose life has hit the shits. He's in major debt because of a gambling problem. And worse than that, he's a gym teacher. Who's in big trouble because he put a student in a sleeper hold. I mean, the kid had it coming, but still don't do that. His punishment? The only thing worse than teaching gym class. Supervising, Supervising detention. detention. And that's where Paul meets his toughest opponents yet, the St. Jones Seven. The seven hardest, angriest, most violent 17-year-old girls in the school, like Rena, she likes Satan, 
Amanda. She'll try and sleep with your dad. G. Uh, she's just a very confused 23-year-old German exchange student. She thinks this is camp. And then there's Tessa. Quiet, queer, tough as nails, and smart as hell. Because of her rough upbringing, Tessa has this powerful inner rage she can't control. She's, she's fierce, strong-willed, and heading down the wrong path. So naturally, her and Paul butt heads at first, but when that rage erupts and Tessa punches Paul's car and breaks it, he gets an idea. He's gonna get these girls to fight for money in an illegal underground punching association. You mean a fight club? We're not allowed to say that. Right. Okay. Um, Tessa instantly becomes the star fighter in Paul's underground ring, and she finally has something she's never had before, someone who believes in her. Until it all backfires. Who knew that running an underage fight ring had terrible consequences? Sh shit really hits the fan when Paul's gambling debts catch up to him. Uh, the school finds out about the fight club, and Tessa is gravely injured in the final fight. But Tessa finds her strength, overcomes her injury, and rescues Paul with the help of the St. Joan Seven. The final scene is Tessa entering the ring as a world-class UFC fighter with Paul, her coach, by her side. Hashtag sports. Hashtag sports. <laughs> we know what you're thinking. 17-year-old girls bare-knuckle boxing? That's too vicious. Wait, are you thinking that? Because fuck you. <laughs> Would you be thinking that if it was dudes? Look, our film is a dark, wickedly funny, and heartfelt redemption story. It's the Mighty Ducks with period jokes. It's, <laughs> it's men with brooms, but no men and no brooms. It's the Bad News Bears, but with humans. There aren't any bears in that movie. As former angry 17-year-olds and now slightly jaded 30-year-olds, we can attest to the need for more girls kicking ass on screen. Men have all the sports movies. Yeah, no, men in that one. That's a bunch of, that's no. a guy? Uh, he is really bloody. Men, oh, what is that? Oh, men, men with brooms. brooms, men with brooms. Mighty Ducks, they needed more period jokes. Yeah, they did, yeah. Uh, okay, more guys, uh, more dudes. Like like Sam Lott. Okay, uh, yeah, no. Is Bugs uh, Bunny a girl? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> not, 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 oh, <laughs> that's just my dog. <laughs> there aren't half as many female-driven sports movies. I mean, as women in the sports movie industry, we're really in a league of our own. We want to show the world that women are funny. And Canadians are funny. And Canadian women are funny. <laughs> She's, She's so, so funny. funny. She is so funny. <laughs> funny. Josh and Kyle are two Canadian filmmakers who know funny. They're like a cheaper Seth and Evan. Uh, their film, Adventures in Public School, premiered at TIFF, opened TIFF Top 10 last year, and sold to Netflix. They, they're currently working on a project with E1 and Mark Gordon. They get shit done and at high quality. And crucially, they understand the importance of women being in charge of their own stories. So we will be searching for a female-identified director and a predominantly female crew to make this happen. They're strong allies who believe in this movie. You might say that they're hitching their wagon to our star. I mean... I think with their success, it's the other way around. Shh, here's a budget slide. Good, good budget. budget. <laughs> Our film is currently in the second draft packaging stage. It was selected from across the country and world for transatlantic partners and Finn strategic partners. We will do whatever it takes to get this movie made. We'll even fight someone. I already have. <laughs> the St. Joan 7 is a film for all the girls and women of the world who have felt like the world's punching bag. Because we think it's time to punch back. Thank you all Thank you. so You've much. You've been so great. Oh, wait, oh, should we do it? Should we do it? Should we yep. do it? Okay, we're, we're gonna, gonna do, do it, we're doing it. Okay, everybody, look under your seats. Look under your seats right now. Look under your seats. There's nothing there. That's why we need the money. Please give us the money. <laughs> Good night, New York. We love you, Denver. Awesome. I'm definitely going to be Googling if Bugs Bunny is a boy or a girl later. Um, our, next fil our next pitch is for a film called The Incident Report. And here's who's coming out to tell you about it. Uh, 
Julie Baldassi is a Toronto-based producer and founder of Younger Daughter Films. Her 2018 short film, My Dead Dad's Porno Tapes, directed by Charlie Tyrell, had its world premiere at Sundance, a digital release on the New York Times Op Docs, and won Best Documentary Short at South by Southwest in 2018 and played numerous festivals. Her, her feature debut, Dim the Fluorescence, won the 2017 Slam Dance Dramatic Grand Jury Prize, and most recently she produced The Book of the Dog, a web series for First Look Media's Topic.com, starring Fred Armisen, Janine Garofalo, Louis Black, and Lucy Punch. Julie has a Tibetan language narrative feature, Tenzin, in completion, and several independent features in development. Filmmaker Naomi Jay has a flair for cinematic scale, unconventional storytelling, and striking visual execution. Her debut feature film, The Pin, is Canada's only Yiddish language narrative film and opened in theaters across North America to rave reviews. The New York Times declared, it's almost bewildering to think what this first time feature director could build with a larger budget. Alumni of the TIFF Talent Lab, Berlin Talents, and Torino Labs and TIFF Studio, Naomi is currently developing an adaptation of Martha Bailey's novel, The Incident Report. Naomi is an adjunct professor at Ryerson University and pursuing her MFA at York University. So please welcome with their six minutes, the pictures for The Incident Report. Countless incidents take place in public libraries, and when they do, it's the librarian in charge who is asked to fill out the necessary forms, also known as the incident report. My name is Julie Baldassi, and this is Naomi J. Naomi is the writer and director, I'm the producer, and our project is the incident report, um, adapted from Martha Bailey's novel. Miriam Gordon is a 35-year-old librarian working in a neighborhood home to the mad and the marginalized. She, when incidents occur, as many do, she is required to fill out the necessary forms and keeps them in her top desk drawer. She, they look to her like a deck of cards. Oh, we're behind. <laughs> a little behind. I'm catching up. Okay. Incident report number 73. Unusually pale female patron enters the library wearing a tennis skirt flung confidently around her shoulders, resembling a toga. At 3.35, she threatens to lock me in a cage. Shortly thereafter, she defecates on the carpet. Miriam's daily routine is unyielding. She cycles to work, eats her lunch in the adjacent Allen Gardens Park, and at 6 p.m., rides back home to her apartment. Until one day, she happens upon a chasm in her street. A cyclist whips by, knocking her into the hole where she lands flat on her back, her body bruised, but alive with sensation. She lays there until morning light. Something has happened. The next day in the library, between the pages of a book, she finds an odd note threatening her, written by a man who believes himself to be Rigoletto by the famous, the famous opera by Verdi, about a father who inadvertently and tragically kills his daughter. Miriam was also inadvertently and tragically killed by her father, emotionally anyway. Miriam's mother finds Miriam's father's body hanging in the family garage, surrounded by books. She was 22. Miriam tells us early on, I am not a person who recovers, and she did not. She locks herself up in a kind of prison, the library where she works, surrounded by books, just like her father. One lunch in Allen Gardens, Miriam notices a man. He's missing a finger. Yanko is a Slovenian artist, and now in Toronto, he drives a cab. He invites her home for tea and plum cake, and they fall in love. But as love and mystery, <laughs> as love and mystery uh, fill her world, fragments of memories come back to her in the form of apparitions in the library. Who is Rigoletto? Oh, it, forcing her to deal with emotions buried long ago. Can she untangle the mystery? Who is Rigoletto? A deranged library patron? Her father come back from the dead? Or Miriam's mind playing tricks on her? But before the mystery can be solved, Yanko is brutally murdered in his cab, a, an apparent victim of a petty crime. So much is uncertain. The letters stop, Yanko's killer is not found, but Miriam, amidst this chaos and uncertainty, 
quits her job at the library, and moves to Slovenia. The film, like the book, is made up of many fragments that are broken up and when joined again in a single thread, create the momentous journey of a woman who, after a decade of living inside her head and inside a library, is forced outside of herself and outside into the world. I fell in love with this book as soon as I saw it. This felt like it was material for a Naomi J film, a small, intimate story set in one location, in this case, a library, where the protagonist, living in isolation, is forced to connect. With the incident report, I want to immerse the viewer in a compelling world of what is real, what is imagined, what is fact, what is fiction, what is sanity, and what is madness. I want the viewer to feel what it's like to be inside the head of Miriam Gordon. I first met Naomi about a year ago after a mutual friend had introduced me to The Pin, Naomi's ambitious micro-budget first film, um, a slow-burning drama spoken entirely in Yiddish by actors who had to learn the language for the role. I had been a producer on two micro-budget features and I was looking for a project to take on as lead producer and ideally finance at a level higher than excruciatingly small. <laughs> And here was Naomi, this powerhouse director with an amazing project, The Incident Report. What got me was not only the story, but the dark and surreal quality to the world and this strange and menacing mystery. But the mystery is caught up in a love story and the menace is also absurd and funny. I found it to be a tone reminiscent of The Lobster, of Tony Erdman, Broken Flowers. And we are all now in an era where audiences are eager to find protagonists like Miriam Gordon. She's a woman who is transformed by herself through the course of the film, in spite of the men in her life and not because of them. And her journey from unseen to seen speaks to the seismic shift in perspective that we are beginning to see happen around the world. And distributors from <laughs> Elevation to A24, know that there are significant numbers of people out there who are looking for more challenging and innovative material, and those distributors are aiming at them. A good film, of course, starts with a really, really good script. We're fortunate in that we're starting with Martha Bailey's best-selling novel, which was long-listed for Canada Reads and the Giller Prize, which are two of Canada's highest profile literary events in this country. Um, and it also appeared on a number of best books of the year. Naomi has written a very strong second draft and winning this $15,000 would fast track us to finishing a final draft, bringing on a casting director to start attaching talent. And we think this would put us in a really excellent position to finance the film around the million dollar range towards our production target of summer 2019. As you just heard, the New York Times reviewed Naomi's film, saying it's almost bewildering to think what this first-time feature director could build with a larger budget. I happen to agree, and we would like to show you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our final pitch, this afternoon, we're getting into evening, sort of, uh, is for a film called Wildhood, and here's who's gonna come out to tell you about it. Uh, Breton Hanum is a two-spirit filmmaker of Mi'kmaq Ojibwe and Scottish ancestry living in Gesputwik, Mi'kmaq, Nova Scotia, where he was raised. His films deal with themes of community, culture, language, and tradition with a focus on two-spirit and LGBTQ identity. He co-wrote The Short Champagne, which premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. In 2015, he wrote and directed a telefilm micro-budget feature, North Mountain, a two-spirit thriller, which won Best Original Score at the Atlantic Film Festival and the Screen Nova Scotia Award for Best Feature. He is a fellow of the Praxis Center for Screenwriters out Fest Screenwriting Lab and the CFC Writers Lab. Brett regularly teaches writing and directing workshops at the Atlantic Filmmakers Cooperative and in Mi'kmaq territories across Nova Scotia. In 2017, he was selected as one of six filmmakers in Canada to attend the Whistler Film Festival's Indigenous Filmmaker Fellowship. Brett recently completed a short doc commissioned by Cinema Politica in the genre of Indigenous Futurism premiering this week in Montreal. 
Garrett Patrick Pawn is an actor producer with an Acadian and Mi'kmaq ancestry from Halifax, Nova Scotia. He is an alumnus of the Canadian Film Center Producers Lab. Garrett has appeared in recurring roles in Haven, Forgive Me, and AMC's Emmy nominated series, The Killing. His work on screen has, has been recognized with three ACTRA Award nominations. During his Bachelor of Commerce degree at Dalhousie University, Garrett Associate produced the four hour documentary special, Deadly Journeys of the Apostles for National Geographic Channel International. The following year, while still in school, Garrett produced and production managed Wild Wild East and Ocean Parks, 12 hours of nature documentary television for a Smithsonian channel. Garrett is now the founder and president of Rebel Road Films. Rebel Road is in development on a diversified slate of narrative and documentary films and series, including Spirit Talker, a 13 and a half hour documentary series recently greenlit by APTN. I Am Sid Stone, a seven episode web series based on the 2014 Iris Prize nominated short film of the same name and Wildhood. In 2017, Garrett was the recipient of the prestigious Nova Scotia Talent Trust Young Artist of Excellence Award and the Sheila McKenzie Filmmaking Award. So with their six minutes, please welcome the pitch team from Wildhood. Wildhood is a story that's ripped from the scars of my youth. I've been looking for family and heritage since I was little. The pain and anger of growing up as a two-spirit person without them was only eased by my relationships with the land, the animals, my grandmother, and other elders. I spent three decades reclaiming, reconnecting, and healing. Wildhood is the culmination of that journey. Ndaluisin, Brett Hanum, Leawi, Gespukwit, Mi'kma'ki. My name is Brett Hanum, I'm the writer-director of Wildhood. And this is my producer, Gary Patrick Pong. Like a snarling dog backed into a corner, Link is at odds with everyone around him. His Mi'kmaq mother is dead, and his connection to his heritage lost. His white, abusive father Arvin is resentful of his existence, and the boys in the trailer park where he lives are both dangerous and alluring. Desperate to escape his backwater life, Link lashes out at everyone around him. When he finds proof his mother is still alive, he torches Arvin's truck takes his 10-year-old half-brother Travis and heads out into the open road. Lost on the back roads, they're picked up by Buzzamai, a two-spirit fancy dancer on the powwow trail. Buzzamai is drawn to Link's story and offers to help him find his mother. Together, they travel through unseen parts of the wild. And along the way, they're stalked by Arvin, nearly ensnared by a zealot, chased by a rabid raccoon, and hunted by a gang of bikers that are intent on kidnapping Link and selling him into the city. In the face of mounting danger, Link and Buzzamai develop a deep relationship. As Link learns more about Mi'kmaq culture and language from the handsome dancer, the road starts to look less like a wasteland. At the summit of his journey, Link finds the mother he's only seen in dreams, but she's not what he expects, not by far. Defeated and lost, Link willingly returns to his father's grasp, his spirit broken. But instead of coming down like a hammer, Arvin swallows his pride and resentment and brings Link and his mother together so the son can finally begin to mend the wounds he's carried his whole life. Months later, with Buzz and I close by, Link dances at a powwow for the first time. The people that help them on their journey stand by in support for love and for one of their own that has found his way back home. Our collaborations have screened in festivals worldwide like BFI Flair, the Iris Prize, and Frameline. We've built a trust and continue to collaborate because fundamentally, we are outsiders drawn to stories about outcasts. While it was developed this past fall at the CFC Producers Lab, where we attached Damon Dolivera, producer of The Book of Negroes and the Grizzlies, as our executive producer. Last year, the script was shortlisted for the Sundance Screenwriting Lab, and has again advanced to the, se the second stage of consideration this year. The final draft is being developed with CBC Breaking Barriers, and we'll be looking to grow that relationship into one of our financing partners. In July, we shot a proof of concept for the film. In a few weeks, it'll be ready to hit the festival circuit, and has already been pre-licensed by CBC's Canadian Reflections. Our goal with the short was to discover breakout talent who could lead the feature. 
we embarked on the largest indigenous talent search ever on the east coast of Canada, traveling to communities across the Maritimes and auditioning over 50 teenagers. Through this process, we found our leads and started building awareness and excitement for the film. We'll be looking to grow that engagement up until the feature's release. Should we win this competition, all of the money will go to, towards cast, all the prize money will go towards casting. With over 20 indigenous uh, supporting leads, we need more time and resources to cast in a way that we've already shown is successful. A portion of the funds will go to engaging a US casting director to find a star to fill the role of Arvin. Our team is strong and our script is stronger. Our leads are cast, but we now need to cast the rest. Excitement is building within and outside of the community. Your support today is the final piece we need to head into production next summer. Wildhood is a raw and inspiring film about healing, heritage, and daring to take that first step to reclaiming your freedom. Thank you. So that has been six minutes of six pitches, and that's 36 minutes of such hard work from all of our pitchers, so I'd like to give them all a huge round of applause right now because there's clearly so much effort and so much passion that's gone into all of this. Uh, and so the jury is now going to convene to choose the winner. Uh, so just outside here in the industry lounge, there's going to be a happy hour. Let's all get happy. And uh, let's have some drinks. There's going to be some food. And at around 6 o'clock, depending on how the deliberations go, uh, a winner is going to be announced. So I want to thank you all so much for coming. Uh, and thanks for uh, supporting this. And this year is Telefilm Canada's Pitch This. Thank you so much. <laughs>